Welcome to another episode in our incredible series, The Last Empire, Ancient Mysteries Reveal the Future. We are taking an amazing journey in our program this time. We're going to be going to the island of Patmos. Patmos and Star Wars, why is there so much suffering? You know, many people have that question. How come there is so much suffering in our world today? As we go to Patmos and look at the Star Wars great battle from Patmos, we're going to answer that question. Have you noticed that many of the great blockbuster movie films that Hollywood has put out, many of the books, the novels that we read, all have common elements? You think about it. Here's how it goes. Things were once very good. Then, of course, something awful happened. And now, of course, a battle must be fought or a, a journey must be taken. And then at just the right time, a hero comes and he sets everything right. Have you noticed that? And then, of course, after that, life is found again. Or as we say to the kids, everybody lived happily ever after. You know, why is it that books and movies have those common elements? The reason is, is because they all borrow from the same story. It's the story of a great cosmic war, a story of a, a war between good and evil that has been raging for millennia now. In fact, we're going to go back in this program before the beginning of this world, before the beginning of life on this world, before the beginning of history, before the beginning of suffering in our universe. We're going to take a trip way, way back in time in this program together. I want you to come with me to the island of Patmos. The island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea in Greece today was an amazing place in John's time. In fact, when you go to Patmos today, you can notice, of course, here the monastery of St. John the Theologian right up there on the hill as you come into the harbour there in Patmos. Then, of course, it was in John's day a penal colony. You see, they tried to kill John, the Romans did. They tried to boil him in oil, but he wouldn't cook. And so they exiled him here to the island of Patmos as a Roman penal colony at that time. And you can imagine John somewhere here on the shores of Patmos or one of the caves was given on that day incredible visions into the future, including our own time and just beyond. You can actually notice the place where it said that John received those visions. Well, of the traditional place. It's known as the cave of the apocalypse. You can come down here. Not too much of a building here, in fact. But inside there's a cave. And uh, this is supposed to be the traditional place where John received the mighty book of Revelation or the apocalypse. Now, in the centerpiece of John's book, the Revelation or the Apocalypse, we see three evil powers that combine together. This is in the 12th and the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation. Three powers, a dragon, a beast that comes up out of the sea, and you'll notice there, a beast that comes up out of the land. Now, who are these three beasts? What do they represent? Well, we're going to identify these powers in our series. But first of all, in this program, we need to understand about this dragon here. Who does the dragon represent that John saw there in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation? Notice what he says as we go to the book of Revelation. John says in Revelation 12, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. You notice there very clearly, according to the Bible, that this dragon represents Satan, the devil. Now, I can almost hear some of you saying, now give me a break, Gary. Surely an intelligent person like you does not believe in this idea of a, of a, of a devil, of Satan. This is just uh, the figment of people's imagination, this sort of a, a being, uh, just our neurotic imagination, just the devil within us or something like that. Surely you don't believe in a devil. My friend, let me tell you, I surely do. 
And, and I'm going to give you the reasons why I believe in that. In fact, you know, this being would rather nothing more than you and I who not believe in him. There was a Chinese village on one occasion that every harvest time was set upon by some bandits. They stole the harvest of the Chinese uh, villagers. Well, the villagers got sick of this, so they decide, decided to uh, set up a vigilante group to take care of this bandit when he came. And sure enough, harvest time, when the, van when the bandit showed up to take the crop, the villagers were waiting for him with this vigilante group and drove him away. Well, this happened harvest after harvest, year after year. And uh, an old man one day was walking through the forest not far from the village when the, the bandit caught up with him and said, now listen here, old man. He said, listen, I'll give you a bucket of money if you go back to the village and tell the people the bandit's dead. Well, the old man wanted the money, so he went back to the village and he told the people in the village, listen, the bandit's dead. We don't need to worry about the vigilante group anymore. We can disband. And so the villagers did that. And guess who showed up at harvest time, of course? The bandit and his cohorts and took the crops. And that's a bit like it is with this being. He would love us to think that he doesn't exist because if we don't realise he exists, he's got one up on us, you see. But anyway, what's the evidence? What's the evidence that this being called Satan actually exists? There is good evidence. First of all, of course, Jesus believed in the devil and Satan. And we saw in our last program, Jesus was a real person and he was who he claimed to be. And there's a lot of evidence for Jesus of Christ outside of the Bible and outside of Christian sources, as we saw. So Jesus believed in this being. Not only that, there's archaeological evidence points in this direction of this being. Come with me for a moment to the Ishtar Gates in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. Remember we were there in a previous program. Now on the Ishtar Gates, as you can see here, you will notice there is the old dragon on, pictured on those gates. Now the dragon for the Babylonians was a symbol of evil. Not only the Babylonians saw the dragon as this, but when you go to the mighty uh, city of the Medo-Persians, Persepolis, and uh, we took a group here just last year, a magnificent city back from the ancient times. Alexander the Great destroyed this city when he came here. But you will notice on the reliefs of one of the, uh, in, in, the in Persepolis, there is this relief of a Hiraman, the, uh, the dragon, fighting Darius I, or the other way around. Darius I, the, Darius the Great, a great Medo-Persian king, is fighting a Hiraman, the dragon. And for the Persians, he is a symbol of evil, just as for the Babylonians. So the biblical writers saw the same thing you see here that other cultures had of this being, a symbol of evil, the dragon. Now who is this dragon devil? Who is he and where did he come from? How did he originate? Now John tells us in his book, Revelation chapter 12, 7, the Bible says, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels. Now of all places for war to break out, heaven would be the last place we would expect such a thing to take place. But that's what the Bible says. And that's one of the great reasons that I believe in this book is, is, is true because it doesn't gloss over things. It doesn't just paint pretty pictures. The Bible says it broke out in heaven. God tells us that through John the Revelator. This is where it began. God tells it like it is. Now you remember George Lucas's great Star Wars movies. Remember, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Those blockbuster movies, what were they? The Return of the Jedi. And then, of course, The Empire Strikes Back. Now, of course, these are fictitious films that actually draw on this, from this bigger story. But we want to go back to the original Star Wars, to the real Star Wars way back in time the original one. Now, the devil or Satan, there are two portraits of this being in this amazing book, which we've seen is so accurate historically and whose prophecies are dependable. Two portraits are given 
in the Bible. Now, the first one is found in the book of Ezekiel, who's living in Babylon at the same time as Daniel. And he gives a portrait of this being. He's figured as the, fr- as the, the king of Tyre is the front for this being. So back of the king of Tyre in Ezekiel's book is this being the dragon or the devil and Satan. But I want to talk for a moment about Tyre, the great city of Tyre that Ezekiel talks about right here in his books before we have a look at this portrait of this being the devil or Satan in his book. Tyre was a great Phoenician city-state. It's in Lebanon today. That country is where Tyre is. Now, it stretched for about 30 kilometres along the Mediterranean Sea back in its heyday. Not only that, but it had, Tyre had colonies around the Mediterranean Sea, North Africa and so on, because it was a great sea trading nation, city-state, and it set up colonies. One of those colonies was Carthage, a colony of Phoenicians, and we're going to go there in another program soon to Carthage. Now, ships of all the nations anchored their ships in the great seaport of Tyre on the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, here the merchants bought and sold their wares. Now, this book gives specific biblical predictions concerning the future of Tyre. And I want you to notice these for a very good reason we'll see when we've had a look at these predictions. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 26 now, just before we get to this picture of the the devil and Satan in his book. He says in Ezekiel 26, Behold, I am against you, O Tyre, says God, and I will cause many nations to come up against you, as the sea causes its waves to come up. For thus says the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I will bring upon Tyre Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings, from the north. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her a bare rock. And they will plunder your wealth, he says. And what else? Loot your merchandise and they will break down your walls, demolish your fine houses, and throw your stones, your timber, and your rubble into the sea. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. Now, you will agree with me, there are some very specific predictions that are mentioned right here by the prophet Ezekiel. Let's put them up here. The five predictions that are mentioned here. Number one, Nebuchadnezzar would attack the city of Tyre. Number two, other nations would attack Tyre. Thirdly, Tyre would be like a flat rock. It would be scraped like a flat rock. Fourthly, Tyre would be thrown into the sea. And finally, it would become a place for the spreading of fishing nets. Five very specific predictions. Well, what happened? Did these things take place? Now, we know from history now that Nebuchadnezzar, in fact, did besiege the city of Tyre. It took him 13 years he besieged that mainland city of Tyre, and finally he destroyed the city. But the people of Tyre simply escaped to, in their boats to the, a little island just off the shore, about a kilometre offshore, because they were sea-trading people. But Nebuchadnezzar couldn't pursue them because he was from Iraq and didn't have any ships on this uh, this campaign of his. And so the people were able to escape and take all their treasures with them to the offshore island. And Nebuchadnezzar left pretty much without anything. Well, centuries went by, two centuries went by, and it almost looked like this prediction would not be fulfilled completely, you see. Then came Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was on his way to Egypt and he came to Tyre to destroy it because he felt the the Medes and the Persians were siding with these people, of course, and so he wanted to destroy the city of Tyre. He attacked the city of Tyre and he did indeed destroy this city, completely destroyed it. But the people of Tyre again, they went on their offshore island by their boats again after their mainland city had been destroyed by Alexander and took all their loot and their treasures with him. Now, 
Alexander was not going to give up, however. He wanted that treasure and he wanted to destroy the people of Tyre. And so what he did was this. He said to his soldiers and his workmen, get all the rubble here from the mainland city that we've just destroyed and dump it into the ocean. And we're going to build a causeway out to that offshore island. And that's exactly what they did. They gathered up the rubble and you can still see it here today. Some of the columns of the city of Tyre, the old city from this time, in the ocean. He, in fact, he, he got as much rubble as he could and he scraped the thing like a, a, like a rock, a bare rock almost, to get enough to throw into the sea and dumped it and built that causeway out to the people of Tyre and took the loot and destroyed the people. Now, when you go to Tyre today, you will notice, by the way, you can see here on this, this image here, that the sands of time have washed up and this be, island has become a peninsula, this causeway and the island at the end. It's like a peninsula, but from the air you can see clearly where the island once was now, Alexander's Causeway. But today, when you visit Tyre, you will notice this, it's a fishing port today and the fishermen spread their nets everywhere in Tyre. Now, you can see again the tremendous historical and prophetic accuracy of this book. This is not fairy tales. Somebody knew something way in ahead of, ahead of time. And why do, we, why do we mention this? Because if the Bible is so accurate about Tyre, then we can believe it when it talks about this being who is behind the king of Tyre, namely the devil or Satan. The Bible is trustworthy. It's got a proven track record. It's historically accurate. And so it has trustworthy information and we can believe what it now says about this being. So let's come to this image now, this picture, this first portrait of the king of, of, of Satan. The front for him is the king of Tyre. He's working through this power. Notice what it says here now in the book of Ezekiel 28. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. Now, obviously, this is not the king of Tyre, but the being behind Tyre. The garden of God, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. Now, a cherub is a type of an angel in the Bible, and he's the anointed or covering cherub. He's the guardian angel of God. Again, way beyond the Tyre. It's the being behind the king of Tyre. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you, says God. You were on the mountain of God. So who is this dragon devil? Who is this being who warred against God? Notice what the Bible says. Number one, he was in Eden at one stage. Secondly, he was created by God. And thirdly, he was the anointed cherub, the guardian angel of God. Who is this being? The Bible says he, these were the facts about this being originally. In fact, the Bible goes on to say in Ezekiel chapter 28, 15, you were perfect in all your ways from the day you were created till sin was found in you. So you see, God did not make a devil. He made a perfect being. He was created perfect and originally. Now, what was this sin that was found in this being who was created perfectly by God himself. What sin are we talking about here? Notice Ezekiel goes on to explain in his 17th verse, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. In other words, he got a big head regarding how he, what he looked like. He must have been a spectacular looking being. So it was pride or self-centeredness that was at the heart of the fall of this being. He got a big head, we would say today. Pride or self-centeredness, which leads us to the second portrait of this being that we find in this book. Notice what the Bible says here in Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. We read now from the writings of Isaiah. And remember, two almost complete scrolls in the Dead Sea collection of the book of Isaiah were discovered. So let's read this now. 
It says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, says God. Now you will notice this being's name originally was Lucifer, which means the day star. Now, by the way, when I was a kid, we had to light the chip heater in those days. But we would cheat, my brother and I, Murray and I. We would buy some of these little tiny squares soaked in, of wood soaked in kerosene. They called them little Lucifers. Because behind this, this being is, is, people know this means the devil. He was originally called Lucifer, but then he became the devil. So this name is even around today, of course. Now, Lucifer, meaning the day star, was once a perfect being. But notice what happened here as Isaiah continues. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. And then notice what he says. I will be like the Most High. I will be like God himself. You notice this being has an eye problem. He's got eye disease, so to speak. I, I, I. And you've probably noticed that the middle letter of pride is I. The middle letter of Lucifer is also I. In fact, the middle letter of sin is I. You see, this is where problems originate from. I, I, I. You think about it. That's what happens in the home. Somebody wants to do it their way, and so marriage relationships and human relationships disintegrate because of selfishness and self-centeredness. It happens in the, in, in the political world. Somebody wants to be top dog and, and sometimes even almost destroys a political party over it. It happens among the nations. I, I, I. Somebody wants to go to war for themselves, for what they're going to get. I, I, I. Well, this is where it began way back in heaven, the Bible says, with this being, I. In other words, the desire to take God's place, to be in control where God should be in control of even his own life. This was it, the desire for self, the love of power rather than the power of love. This is where it began. And so this being called Lucifer now began a campaign uh, of deceit to discredit the character of God. And isn't that how it happens even in the world today? You think about it. If people want to get to the top, so often they will gossip, they will lie about other people to pull them down so they can get up in their place. It happens in the political world. It happens in the world of business. It happens in sport. It happens in the world of media. Somebody wants to get to the top so they will deceive in order to put themselves up where others, to bring others down. It's, it, and this is how it happened. This is where it began. Same thing. He began to discredit God's character, talk about God. Now, these are the two activities of this being now. Jesus talked about this being. He believed in a devil, let me tell you. Jesus, in fact, cast out demons, spirit beings out of people, according to to this book which we've seen is so accurate but this is what Jesus said he said of this being he was a liar and a murderer from the beginning so two activities of this being deception and destruction he deceives people in order to destroy people this is the way he goes about his business and what he lives for and so the Bible puts it this way war broke out in heaven of all places, as we said, for a war to break out. You see, Lucifer became Satan. God did not make a devil, did not make a Satan. Does a woman give birth to a drunkard? Well, you say, of course not. She gives birth to a beautiful baby who by it, his or her choices becomes a drunkard. And it was the same with this being Lucifer. God made a perfect being who by his choices became Satan. And he took one third of the angels with him now in his rebellion against God. 
Notice what John says as we go back to the book of Revelation chapter 12. The Bible says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems or crowns on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, flung them down. Now, John continues and we see what do the stars represent in his book. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So the stars represent angels. That's why we call it Star Wars Among the Stars, the angels. Angel wars, maybe we could call it. Led by this being to rebel against the God who created them. That's how it was. An exalted angel, once exalted, Lucifer, now became a falling angel, a falling being. Now some of you ask perhaps or thinking, why didn't God just destroy this being immediately? Zap him, zunk, he's gone. I would have solved the problem. Well, that's the way we may have handled it, but God is a lot smarter than we are. And God knew he couldn't handle it that way. Let me illustrate. Here we have President Barack Obama and his family here. I like that picture. I hope they always stay a happy family. But you imagine if President Obama is accused by his cabinet ministers there in the, in the White House of embezzling government funds. Now, would President Obama prove his innocence by calling in the police and saying, listen, just do away with those guys, mow them down. And would, that, would that remove the problem? No, well, of course, on the contrary. People would say, he must be guilty. Because look how he's tried to get rid of the evidence, even though he was innocent. No, God didn't do it that way. That would not solve the problem one bit. It would not help beings. In fact, you know, God is a loving God and he does not want his creatures to relate to him out of fear. He wants relationships based on love. And you can imagine people, his beings that he created would have said, don't cross God or you'll be dead meat, so to speak. He'll zap you. No, God had to handle this in a different way so that people could see through this being. In fact, Jesus gave us the principle that God operated from. He told a story one day about a farmer who planted seeds, planted wheat, and the wheat began to spring up. A couple of days later, his labourers, his, the men he'd hired, uh, came rushing into him and said, hey boss, we, we planted wheat the other night, but now weeds have sprung up among them. Someone must have planted some weeds among this stuff. Shall we go and pull out the weeds out of the wheat? And the boss said, no, don't do that. Because you see, if you do that, you will pull up the wheat, the wheat with the weeds. No, he said, let both the weeds and the wheat grow to harvest and then it will be clearly seen which is the wheat, which are the weeds and when you pull out the wheat, you can pull it out all, it's all ripe and put it in one pile and the weeds in another. Let them both grow together. Otherwise, you'll destroy some of the good when you destroy the bad. So God had to let Lucifer, who now has become the devil, play his hand so that all his created beings would then see what really was happening and what his character was really like. And so the Bible says, we just read in Revelation, that this being, Satan, was now thrown down to this world with his angels. Now this world was God's most recent creation now. And uh, God had made this beautiful world uh, for human beings to populate. And Adam and Eve were the first parents of the human race, according to the Bible, which we'd be seeing is so accurate. But into that garden home of Adam and Eve one day, there slithered a snake. And the snake, in actual fact, was the first channel for the dragon, the first front for Satan that he used on this planet. Now the Bible says this about the snake. Notice back in Revelation 12 verse 9. So the great dragon, that serpent or snake of old called the devil and Satan. Why does Revelation, way back 2,000 years ago, 
4,000 years before, after the story of the snake itself. Why does God call the dragon the snake? Because of the story of the snake in the Garden of Eden, because he was the first front for the dragon or Satan. Now let's come and think about the snake in the ancient world. In the ancient world, the, the snake or the serpent is a symbol of superior deceptive wisdom. It's also a symbol of evil and disobedience. You come with me to Egypt for just a moment and you will notice they had snake gods. One of them was Tithrambo, the god of revenge and, and, and of punishment. There was another god by the name of Typhon. He was the author of all moral and physical evil for the Egyptians. In fact, in the Egyptian hieroglyph, you will notice here, we have the Egyptian hieroglyphs and the serpent or the snake represents subtlety, cunning, lust, sensual pleasure, all the things that we know are not quite right. This is what the snake represents. So the snake was a medium or a channel for Satan, a front for Satan in the Garden of Eden as he communicated with the woman. Now, before we move further in this story, I want you to understand something that we, well, we should all understand, and that is this. To have the genuine article of love if someone really loves someone, they must not only give them the right to say yes to them, they must also allow them the right to say no to them. Because if you don't, if you don't give someone the right to say no, you have nothing more than just a machine, a robot, or a puppet on a string. And God gave human people, humankind, the freedom of choice, where they could choose for him or against him. And that's what real love is all about, the freedom of choice, to even go against the one who made you. And God put that freedom of choice within man. He didn't create us as robots. And the Bible puts it this way. It says in Genesis chapter, chapter um, 1, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... You shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, you'll notice there. What was going on here? You can have any tree that you want, all the trees you can eat from, but just not one. You see, what was happening here was God was allowing humankind to exercise their freedom of choice, to say no to him or yes to him. That's what was happening. And they were told, now listen Adam and Eve, if you eat this fruit you will die. You need to know the consequences. Now it wasn't because God was trying to be vindictive or just some arbitrary decree, no. You see, when we go against God, we sever our relationship with God and with God is life. He is the source of life according to the Bible. There is no life without God. The Bible puts it this way. In Psalm 36, 9, For with you, God, is the fountain or the source of life. And so that's why God said, listen, if you eat of it, you, you need to know the consequences, you will die. Now what was going on here really was something like a polling sto a station where Adam and Eve could vote. God was saying to them, vote for me. I love you and I want you to be with me forever so vote with me stay away from that tree by voting for me you'll stay away but you have the freedom of choice if you want to vote for satan then you'll eat of the tree but you need to know something adam and eve before you do the consequences of your choice will be death not because i'm gonna just get even with you but because you're cutting yourself off from the source of life namely me you just need to know that fact and so Adam and Eve were able to vote for or against God. Now the Bible continues in this amazing story. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, Now the serpent, the snake, was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said to you, said the snake, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Did God say you shouldn't eat of every tree? Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. God said you'll die, but I'm telling you, you won't die. 
For God knows that in the day you eat, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, haven't we heard that one before? Remember, way back in that war in heaven, what did this Lucifer being who became Satan say? I will make myself like the Most High. Now he's saying to Eve, you be God. You be like him. You take that fruit and you'll be like him, says this being. Now, in actual fact, there's more going on than this. This is a double.